Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our National Defense University Foundation Virtual National Security Briefing Series. Today is featuring John Lowry, who is Assistant Secretary of Veterans Employment and Training Service. I'm going to go over a few ground rules, say some thank yous, and then we'll turn it over to Admiral Rogi in just a moment. First, thank you to Elidos. Their sponsorship makes this series possible. We appreciate the ability to bring outstanding speakers to the NDU audience, to our stakeholders, our partners, and our sponsors. We'll be recording this webinar. The webinar will be available to everyone afterwards, and we will make it available within about 24 hours. So if there's something you wanna go back and revisit or you want to share with your colleagues, it'll be available to you. We encourage you to ask questions in the chat. The questions function will be where we will take questions from Secretary for Secretary Lowry, and we will ask the questions of him on your behalf. Everybody is muted, so we won't have any interruptions on the video conference today. We won't hear any background noises, hopefully, and we will get started in just one moment. So today I wanna welcome Vice Admiral Fritz Rogge. He's the 16th president of the National Defense University, and he's responsible for the education of many of our students who are coming from the Department of Defense, the Department of State, other executive agencies, and well over 60 countries each year. We're glad to welcome him and to have him make some remarks on behalf of the university, its faculty, staff, and students. Adam Rogi, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Okay, well, thank you for that kind introduction, James, and I'd like to thank uh, everyone for joining today's webinar. Uh, in particular, I want to uh, thank our special guest, Secretary John Lowry, for joining us to share his time and his insights. Uh, I read with uh, great interest his recent op-ed entitled, uh, Hire a Veteran to Meet the Challenge of a COVID-19 World. Uh, in that, Secretary Lowry pointed out that military veterans are trained to accomplish difficult missions under stressful conditions, and so are uniquely well qualified in their post-military careers to help us navigate these challenging times. I also, of course, want to thank the uh, National Defense University Foundation uh, for hosting today's uh, important national security discussion. Uh, the foundation is one of NDU's most important partners, uh, but in reality, every one of you listening today is one of our partners because of our shared interest in the security of our nation. So just a brief word about the importance of your National Defense University. Uh, national security is our mission. We educate rising professionals to become the senior leaders across military, government, and industry that our nation will depend upon tomorrow. We help them to think critically and strategically and to be comfortable dealing with uncertainty and ambiguity and with dynamic and disruptive change. Now, I'm certain that this crowd appreciates that we live in an increasingly complex, dynamic, and uncertain world. We face many competitors and threats to our security. And to counter these threats, America requires leaders who can outthink adversaries. Because the technological security that we've long enjoyed is important, but it is insufficient to deliver the warfighting advantage that our nation's security demands and that our service members deserve. In fact, competitors <clears throat> are investing heavily to try to erode our technical advantages, so it's imperative that we also create intellectual advantages. And that's our job here at NDU. We develop the critical thinkers, the joint warfighters, the strategic leaders who provide the US and allies with the intellectual overmatch required to prevail against the threats of today and of tomorrow. As James mentioned, our students are in equal parts military members of the US Armed Services, civilians from the US government, uh, departments and agencies, and 120 international students from 75 friendly partner and allied nations. And if we do well at our education mission, then they will graduate with the ability to launch the kind of ideas that could preclude the need to launch weapons. That's a positive effect that reaches far beyond the classroom and far beyond graduation day. Because the ways in which the US and our partners work together on common security challenges are ways that are increasingly joint and interagency and international. That means that the relationships that are built in our classrooms translate directly into the relationships that serve our common security interests. And so the lasting measure of our success is in the peace and security enjoyed by the United States and our partners and allies. In the words of former United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan, education is quite simply peace building by another name. 
It is the most effective form of defense spending there is. So let me then suggest that if you would want the leaders of your national security enterprise, the key decision makers contributing to your peace and security, if you would want them to be well educated in how to do so, then you should not only be partners of NDU, but advocates. And I hope that that will encourage you to learn more about the Chairman's University, your National Defense University, supported by the National Defense University Foundation. So thanks again for joining us. And with that, I'd like to now turn over the microphone to Colonel John Lowry, Assistant Secretary of Labor for the Veterans Employment and Training Service, U.S. Department of Labor. Secretary Lowry. Great. Uh, thank you, sir. And I'm looking for, here we go. Excellent. Uh, thank, thanks very much for the introduction. I really uh, appreciate it, sir. And uh, it's certainly an honor to be uh, here with you. Let, let me just, uh, to level set everyone, tell you a little bit about our agency. Uh, it's, it's called VETS. It's a acronym, it stands for Veterans Employment and Training Service. And we're actually one of many different entities within the uh, US federal government that helps support um, veteran employment. We have counterparts in the Department of Defense, uh, Veterans Affairs, USDA, Department of Transportation, Small Business Administration, and elsewhere. Uh, but we're unique in the sense that uh, this is all we do. This is our core mission, and as such, uh, we are the focal point within the United States government for this space. And um, and uh, that being the focal point puts us in a in a sort of a uh, a different kind of uh, um, uh, situation than some of our our partners. Let me talk a little bit about what the vision of the agency is and uh, how that vision informs our priorities. Uh, you know, for us, it's not just about finding jobs for veterans, uh, because just because you're in a job doesn't mean that you're uh, making a full contribution, that you're uh, happy and fulfilled in the job, that you're um, you know, making the impact that you uh, want to have and that you're continuing to learn and grow, which we know is so important for veterans. So our vision isn't about putting veterans in jobs. It's about helping all veterans reach their full potential in the workplace. It's about closing the gap between sort of what is and what could be. And when you think about it, you know, when a veteran is achieving their full potential in the workplace, they're making they're making incredible contributions to those organizations they serve. They're, and that's good for their their well-being, both their emotional well-being, their economic well-being. It certainly helps uh, their families and their family situations. Uh, as I said, it helps the organizations they serve. And then when you aggregate um, all of that, uh, that's good for America, right? As the admiral was saying, it's it's about um our prosperity as a country which obviously uh feeds into our security um so we really do see that there's a national security element uh to our mission so that vision of having people reach their full potential uh informs our two priorities the first one being is that we absolutely have to get the transition right that transition from uh, military service into the civilian workforce and then the second priority is that we have to have the right strategic partners to maximize our impact for the veteran. And let me let me unpeel those a little bit in, in opposite order. The reason why the strategic partnership piece is so important to us is, um, you know, I, as I said, we're one of many organizations within the, the federal government, but we have something going for us, and that is we are the focal point, right? So we need to use that clout, if you will, and make sure that we have the right partnerships. And I'm not just talking about partnerships within the United States government, but I'm talking about uh, government, non-government, for-profit, not-for-profit. Uh, as, as Admiral Mullen has talked about, you know, there is a sea of goodwill out there that uh, of organizations that want to support veterans and veterans' causes. So what we're doing inside VETS is making sure that as we look across that sea, that we're partnering with the right organizations. And uh, for we're doing an inventory right now and for the organizations that are uh, producing a good return uh, to the veteran, uh, we're doubling down on those. For those relationships that may 
uh, not be yielding as much. Maybe we back away uh, from those and uh, and then constantly look out over the horizon to see who aren't we partnered with, who we should be partnered with. So the other priority, as I mentioned, is we absolutely have to get the uh, transition right. Um, you know, when when we can crank a degree or two uh, of extra slope on someone's career trajectory as they come out of the service and help them hit that slope uh, with a running start, the compounding benefits of that over time are incredible, right? Just think about it. It's, it's like the difference between starting to save for your retirement in your 20s versus starting in your 50s. Conversely, you know, if someone flounders uh, at the transition and, and sort of bounces around for uh, several years before they really hit their groove, that also uh, has costs and, and their opportunity costs. Uh, and and so it's it's sort of the you know the, the negative side of the coin. So let's let's basically get it right is is what our vision is. Uh, where we spend our money as an agency, uh, most of the money is actually spent on those safety net type programs that are meant to address uh, suboptimal outcomes, right? It's it's homeless veteran reintegration into the workforce uh, type programs. It's it's funding staff to help the a veteran who's been out of work for many years and been maybe out of uniform for 10 or 20 years, but has been chronically unemployed or underemployed. To me, if we can get the transition right, um, we'll have fewer unemployed veterans. We'll have fewer homeless veterans. It's the old you know, ounce of prevention um, is, is worth a pound of cure. So even though I just was talking about unemployed and, and underemployed and homeless veterans. Uh, that is not the narrative. And um, what, the, what the narrative is about veteran employment is a very positive story. Uh, veteran household income on, on average, or the median rather, median household income is 17% higher than their non-veteran uh, counterpart. Unemployment is less for the veteran population than the non-veteran population. And we're seeing that gap widen during this COVID-19 uh, crisis, which suggests to me that employers wanna hold on to their veterans uh, even more during a period of, of, of stress and duress. Uh, the participation rate for veterans, uh, if you look at the age groups from 20 to 64, and you cut that in five-year increments, every single one of those cohorts the veteran participation rate in the workforce is higher than the non-veteran cohort. And that only changes at the 65 and over group. Why? Because you know, those are the years that people typically want to retire and the veterans are in a better position to enjoy their retirement and don't necessarily have to work. Veterans uh, better retention on average with their employers and they're also quicker to be promoted. So it's, it's a very, very good story. And what I want to share with you know all of our partners, and certainly NDU is is a partner in this because NDU is is with the people that are still uh, still wearing the uniform and, and thinking about their transition. Obviously, not immediately, or they these students would be sent to NDU, right? The military is not done with them yet, but someday they will become veterans, and they certainly will lead people uh, that are going to go through the transition. And all of us that are in this space and have an interest in this need to do everything we can to help those people make a, a successful transition. Because we know that the best recruiter out there is that successful veteran. And, uh, and we will, by helping our veterans and our, our transitioning service members have a good transition, we're gonna be helping those recruiters of tomorrow repl replenish the all volunteer force. So let me uh, just, just stop right there and, and turn it back over to James. Uh, and ho hopefully these uh, introductory remarks uh, were, were helpful in orient you, orienting you to our agency. Thank you very much, Secretary Lowry. I appreciate that. For me, the reason that I think that you're a great partner for NDU is less about the folks who are in education right now and who are gonna make their own transitions and more about how they are thinking about preparing the national security workforce and the defense sector workforce, both for the people who they lead while they're still serving, but also for those who are gonna make that transition and to ensure that the people who they're leading get the best education that they can, that they apply that education to the defense of our country while they're serving, 
that they get the best opportunities to pursue education and training, whether that is through use of the GI Bill or tuition assistance dollars, that they think about how they are gonna to continue to serve after they leave military service and the experience that they're going to take into that national security or defense sector workforce that is going to inform how they are working and facing the threats that our nation faces. When I think about their experience in the cybersecurity or operational environment, they're definitely more familiar than their civilian counterparts who have never served. When I think about working on the equipment that is supplied by companies, whether those are the Lockheed Martins or the Northrops or our partner Boeing, or working with firms like IBM and Lidos and information security and technology, or working with the Silicon Valley companies like Google and Microsoft and Amazon and others, they're going to be better prepared because they know what our military is working on. And when I think specifically about the colleges that are here at the National Defense University, I think about the Eisenhower School and the work that they're doing on all of the industry tracks that their students study and that their graduates work in that go on to manage programs and other things. So to me, labor is an ideal partner. You're looking at what our workforce needs for the future, and you're thinking about what sorts of educational preparation, training, apprenticeships, and other sorts of things are going to lead to those successes that enable our business community and our, our national security and defense workforces to be successful. But I think one of the things that we're not doing yet is really thinking about transition far enough ahead. You spend your day every day thinking about that, and DOL Vets thinks about it every day. But our military service members don't necessarily think about what's tomorrow because they're so focused on today's mission. And what I want to do is think about how do we blend that preparation for transition with the preparation to do their job better every single day and how we can take a leadership position. So anything you want to react to there? Yeah, no, I, I think you're absolutely right, James, that um, we do not, we, we tend to think about the transition as an event instead of a process. Now, uh, the good news is I know uh, the VA, the Department of Defense, the Department of Labor, we, we are partnering together to figure out how do we reframe this in, in the minds of the service members that this isn't, this isn't an event, this is a process and it's a process that arguably begins when you stick your hand up in the air the first time and be, begin your work in life, right? Because we, we all are on a journey the veteran's journey happens to begin with military service, but uh, it doesn't end with military service. You know, the vast majority of people get get out and go on to do other things. Uh, there are some good uh, programs that are on the horizon within, um, again, as I said, with VA and DOD. Um, M2C is one that comes to mind where we're thinking more holistically about the journey and we're thinking about how do you leverage the skills that you're naturally acquiring um, in your through your MOSs, through the works that, that you do every day, and and augment those somehow so that they uh, and, and develop the credential so that when you hit the transition, you actually have a ready-made credential that will travel with you. Um, all the services have the uh, credentialing opportunities online, the cool platforms which is uh, one way to get uh, occupational um, credentials um, or occupational certs, licenses, put you on an apprenticeship uh, path. The military um, US map, so the United Services uh, Military Apprenticeship Program also lets people who are already working in their MOS move to towards a journeyman's card that are gonna allow them to um, to be successful on, on the back end. And I think to the extent that we can have touch points with that service member along the way, and, and not, not necessarily push them out the door because for some people they'll, you know, they should stay 20 or 30 or 35 years, um, it, but they, they should make the, that should be an informed decision, right? They should be thinking about what's the opportunity cost to staying in? What's the opportunity cost to getting out? What's best for me and my family? Uh, and that, vision of having those conversations and, and informing the service members earlier is is the direction that we're headed. And again, we're moving away from an event and more towards a process and it's about a lifelong journey. 
One of the things that I really like that's been happening with the Department of Labor and working with a variety of partners is the internship and apprenticeship programs. And in many cases, there are also some opportunities for industry fellows to go out and then bring back industry experience to the military. Can you add anything to that? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the apprenticeship is just a wonderful avenue for uh, service members or or non-service members, frankly. I mean, if you think about it, the average apprentice uh, starting wage is seventy thousand dollars, and that's seventy thousand uh, dollars that, uh, on top of the money you've made during your apprenticeship, because most apprenticeships are paid, uh, and you're not accumulating a, a bunch of college debt. So, in, in terms of you know, the economic viability of apprenticeship, it, it's a great thing. And it's also something that military people tend to be uh, particularly adept at. It, it, the apprenticeship model is is very analogous to just the way we learn our MOSs in the military. So they're naturally very good students. You know, it's a mixture of hands-on and classroom, practical application uh, type uh, experiences. And we are in the Department of Labor right now really trying to avail more and more service members to these opportunities. Right now we actually have pilot program where we have two installations for each service, uh, Dallas and Travis for the Air Force, Cherry Point and Miramar for the Marine Corps, uh, Norfolk and San Diego for the Navy and uh, Bliss and Bragg in the Army where we actually have apprenticeship counselors there to offer sort of one-on-one -on -one service to anyone who might want an apprenticeship and what we want to do is help them get vectored into the right trade or the right apprenticeship for them and also land them in the location where they want to go. So I would look, and because we are in the Department of Labor, which has its own office of apprenticeship, we have enormous resources here uh, to, to afford opportunities for servicemen and women. One of the things that I learned a lot about and didn't really recognize is that apprenticeships are not just for the trades and that people are taking apprenticeships in a variety of industry sectors, including computer science and uh, cybersecurity and information technology and even consulting and other practices like that. And that the apprenticeship model was an interesting way to trade experience between industry and the private sector and the military. Um, I think there's some really interesting programs, for instance, with Microsoft and the Microsoft Systems Academy work that's right. being done and people who are learning. Anything that you want to add related to those sectors? Yeah, absolutely. So that so this is uh, you know beyond those apprenticeship pilots I was talking about. You know the Microsoft program that you uh, just mentioned is part of the SkillBridge portfolio. And we have more than 300 uh, partner organizations, mostly companies, but also some trade organizations as well, as well that will come on the installations and allow people that are transitioning out to spend time in those last several months on active duty and getting hands-on experience and again, vectoring them towards uh, a job where they want to do it in, in the, in the uh, the craft or, or the uh, area of work that they're studying. I would say, um, you know, for those commanders out there or, or future commanders who are between commands, uh, please try to make um, these programs, these skill bridge programs uh, available to your uh, men and women. I know it's, it's tough, mission comes first, and I know uh, people don't wanna let their folks go necessarily, uh, but I ask you to consider this is that, you know, 90 days, 100 days from now, you're going to lose them anyway. They made the decision to get out. Their contract's coming up. Um, you're going to have to get, get you know, accustomed to, to working without their presence. And by uh, letting them enroll in, whether it's the Microsoft program or one of 300 others, you're letting them take that running start that I was talking about uh, at their transition. And you're letting them run up that that slope, and uh, you know, that's a future successful veteran out there who's going to help our, our recruiting mission down the road. I think that that's a really important component of it because that recruiting mission is really very important. And thinking also about what the long-term career implications are for military service members who are well prepared, they're going to go on and be successful. And when they're going on and being successful in the defense sector or the national security sector they're going to make a difference in our nation's defense. I, I think that's a really, really important component of it as well. When they're doing well, they're often going to also advise their family members to serve and they're going to be able to provide some 
guidance and insight on the career paths. One of the things that I was interested in in your career as I looked at it is you left the Marine Corps, you had a successful civilian sector career, um, worked with, among others, Harley Davidson and, and so on. But then one of the things that really I thought was interesting was your executive search career. So you were helping place military members into executive roles. How would you say military members were doing as compared to their civilian counterparts there? And what kinds of career opportunities can they look for in the long term? But as I, I said before, um, the, generally speaking, the veteran the veteran does better in the workforce, and, and I think there's there's a few reasons for that. Um, first of all, it's you can't be a veteran if you haven't served, and you and you can't have served unless you met the the basic requirements to get in, in the first place. And as we know. Um, you have to be well above average to, to be able to get in the military in the first place. And then you have this wonderful experience in the military where you're learning all of these soft skills and hard skills along the way that have particular value. You're also learning some cultural agility, right? Because as you bounce around during your career, you end up different locations with different sort of subcultures and you have to reinvent yourself throughout your career in the military. And, and the, the other thing that's really important about military people is that they have a habit of continuous learning, right? So the, you know, the students at NDU right now are in a learning mode. They're reinventing themselves to be the strategic leaders of tomorrow. This is probably not the first time they've been to school. They probably went to command and general staff college. They probably went to a career course. They started their, their career um, you know, going to school. And then they've been punctuating those kind of formal passages through the, the schoolhouse with picking up different schools, whether it's our skills, whether it's MOS related, or I'm sure there's a number of six sigma black belts out there in the audience. And that ability, that habit of reinventing oneself, picking up new skills is what makes your veteran on average a lot more valuable and a lot more um, successful than the people that haven't been brought up and spent their formative years in those kinds of uh, environments. I think it's also important to look at what kinds of other education opportunities there are. As we were talking with Admiral Rogi a little bit earlier, he talked about his civilian sector education and master's degrees. And when I look at yours, um, you've got a master's degree from Stanford, a master's degree from Harvard, and you pursued education in a way that was going to make you successful whether you were in the service or out of the service. What would you say to folks who are thinking about education while they're in service now that is in addition to that professional military education component? How does that impact their opportunity? Yeah, um, well, you know, a lot of people will when they ask for advice, you, you, you tell them what you did and I'm gonna do that. I did that. I So when I got the Stanford degree, I was on active duty and did it through tuition assistance. Um, it worked for me. <laughs> it was. Um, to me just the point is the point is just be a continuous learner and if you're a continuous learner whether or not you're going through some kind of formal it'll get you a degree path or you're just uh reading and staying informed and trying to pick up new skills uh both of those bring an incredible amount of intrinsic value the one that leads to the piece of paper or the certificate however does give you a little bit of extra value and i'll just give you a so a fun fact here that so when I was born, I was I was born in 1961. Okay, in 1961, only one in 20 jobs in America required any kind of certificate or occupational license or journeyman's card or anything like that. One in 20. Today, that number is one in four, right? And it's likely to be one in three. And and the reason why this credentialing thing is becoming so much more important is sort of what the admiral was saying is that it's an increasingly dynamic world that we live in. It's more competitive. There's more people. Our our thoughts have evolved around professionalism in general. Our thoughts have evolved around workplace safety, and of course, a lot of these accreditations uh, make ensure the workplace safety. But the the point of that is is that if you can on the sides around your normal training do some extra education and certification uh, it's only going to uh, stand you in better stead it's going to help differentiate you from everyone else and and don't forget the, the real reason you do it is the intrinsic value of what you learn thank you 
What do you think the importance is for the Department of Labor to work with business and industry and understand the future workforce needs and the future of work? No, I think I think it's very important uh, for us because we can't, you know, our customer is the veteran, right? We we want to again enable every veteran to fulfill their potential in the workforce. And if if we don't understand what the needs of the workforce are, right, we're not going to be able to fulfill our mission. So uh, we work very closely with industry, and uh, you know, some of what some of what I was saying about the importance of credentialing is direct feedback that we're hearing from the industry. As Admiral said, this is becoming you know a more complex world rather than a less complex world, and it's going to be defined by uh, disruption, which of course is going to take you know many different forms. We're living through a big disruption now. Uh, this kind of disruption, the COVID, is thankfully rare, but the disruption that's driven by innovation uh, is going to be very common going forward. And they say that someone who joins the workforce today will likely have four distinct careers uh, through their lives as the needs in industry change. So our intent is to get out in front of what those evolving, changing needs of industry are, and then use that insight to sort of inform people to make, to help them make a better transition. But I think, I think we're past the days where someone thinks, you know, they're gonna make a transition and whatever they go into, Right at right out of the gate is going to be what defines the rest of their working life because I think the mo world's moving too fast for, for that to be a, a sustainable model. I think you're right. I think many of us are going to have multiple careers, and one of the things that I think ties veterans together with the active service force is that they have a desire to serve, that they want to contribute back to our nation and continue to be of service, whether that's in their local communities or to the nation as a whole. And I think that that's an important distinction. I also think it's very interesting when we look at what happens in the labor force across the country that the Department of Labor has a distributed workforce. You partner with your regional offices, you partner with the states, and there's a distinction. What do you see as the most important things that are trickling up from the states and the innovations that are coming from the states back up to the national level? Yeah, no, great, great question. So um, the the, what characterizes the relationship is um, a, a very strong partnership with our state workforce uh, partners. And they, uh, there's a National Association of State Workforce Agencies, NASWA, uh, that actually has representatives from all the 50 states. We plug into that organization as well. And it's a forum for best practice sharing. So what, what we try to do is, and again, th and this is one of those strategic partnerships that I was talking about that's so important to us. You know, What we try to do is get the flywheel spinning as fast as we can on sharing of the best practices. Now, there's lots of different uh, constraints that get in the way of having a best practice identified and instantly populated out across all 50 states. But, um, many of those constraints we can overcome and and so our relationship and our job as i see it is to help the states sort of overcome uh the friction that they have in their system certainly you know respecting the you know the state federal divide thing but be be a resource uh for them and we we're trying to give them as much flexibility as we can at the state level uh, because um, we think that more flexibility is better than less flexibility in general. Um, as, as such, just I'll give you a quick example. Um, we, we fund uh, a number of people that work in the uh, job centers that are, that are funded by state employees. And when we had this massive spike of unemployment claims that came in just in the last couple of months, we gave the states the flexibility to use some of the veteran related resources to help get through that backlog so that everyone could then um, support not just veterans, but but all of the, of the population with with uh, employment services. And, and if we hadn't given them that flexibility, they in many cases would still be working through the backlog. So we, we try to partner with them. And like I said, the, the, the big thing is find the best practice and let's try to get that spread around the country as soon as possible. Another interesting area that's happening um, that is really becoming more prominent is a focus on military spouses. 
as a retention tool for the military and helping assist with that. And of course, all of the students who are here right now have just dislocated from wherever they were to here for a year, and then they'll leave here in a year. And many of them have spouses. Um, what kinds of advice do you have for the students and for the faculty here, thinking about how to help those spouses with uh, employment and career development, education, or anything else that labor is focused on? Yeah, great. So. Uh... The good news is, is that I think there's um, a widespread recognition that, you know, the military spouses um, situation is um, one where, you know, we talk about TAP, Transition Assistance Program. Well, that the service member is going through that transition once. The spouse goes through a transition every time there's a, a PCS. And, there, and there's a recognition that, um, the, the spouses actually need some transition assistance. So we are right now actually piloting a military spouse specific curriculum uh, for the military spouse to help them with those intermediate transitions. And there are things that are just unique to their experience. For instance, um, you know, military spouses in general tend to be um, have much more education than their non-military uh, spouse uh, core, and yet they'll have these big gaps on their resume, understandably, because they've been following their military spouse around. And so our curriculum is designed to um, help them convey the story, explain it in a way that, that conveys the value that they would add to the employer. We're also partnered with uh, US Chamber and the Hiring Our Heroes team has a, uh, doing a lot in the military spouse uh, space. Uh, and you probably heard uh, Second Lady, uh, Mrs. Pence, uh, this is, you know, this is the um, her topic, you know, they, and they all, you know, the first ladies and second ladies, they'll pick a topic. This is the mill spouse one is, is hers and it's personal for her because she's got a, uh, a daughter-in-law and in, uh, in the, in a, let's see, her son is in the Marine Corps and she married to someone and I think um, a daughter, I think is a military spouse. So yeah, we're so more help is on the way there, but we, we recognize this is a, this is a challenging environment for the military spouse. Well, that's something that we'll follow up on and make available to our uh, students here so that they can make it available to spouses as well. I think it's an important component of, of our long-term military service. So one of the questions that was asked from an audience member, and I'll let you interpret and, and answer it uh, in the frame that you'd like, but what's the new normal for interactions with uh, employers and employees in the transition process, particularly given the circumstances of COVID, remote interviews, and, and how do we prepare for that transition in a time like this? Right, well, uh, ho hopefully this won't be the new normal to the end of time, uh, but I, 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 will, I will say that we've been really pleased on how um, not just our agency, but all our partners across the U.S. government and our corporate uh, uh, partners and our, and our nonprofit partners have been able to toggle over into providing virtual services. Uh, even though this is very much of a high touch uh, business, we've been able to make that transition with, with very uh, little disruption of service. Now, that said, um, the, the transitions, uh, you know, a lot of people uh, were given the latitude to um, opt out of really a hands-on transition experience. They could take um, courses online, not, not interactive courses like this, but just self-paced courses online. Um, I personally think that that's a mistake because it's not, it's not an adequate substitute to be able to interact live with, with an instructor and get that, that kind of uh, you know, hands-on mentorship. Um, the services are now, and we've had discussions with them, are, are you know, encouraging the people to, to do more of the, the live interactive um, work. And, and now, fortunately, we're seeing some of the brick and mortar uh, transition assistance um, uh, you know, coming back into force. So they're doing these hybrid programs where they'll have a social distance classroom with some people uh, online. I think longer term, what the new normal is, once, once we get the pandemic behind us, it's going to be, um, as I said, you know, we have this sea of goodwill out there. We have a lot of partners that want the same thing, want positive outcomes for the veterans. So it's going to be uh, people like us inside vets better harnessing 
you know, the collective energies of that group to, to yield the outcome for uh, the veteran or help enable the veteran. I think silos are going to be knocked down. I think communication uh, is going to be faster between the private sector and the public sector. And, you know, again, as the Admiral said, things are getting more complex, not less complex. And, and that forces us to become more agile in this space. And, and agility, in my mind, uh, is all, all comes down to uh, the speed of communication, being in real time, getting, getting the right two parties connected at the time they need to be connected. So that's what we're pushing towards. And I think, I think that's what we'll see in the future. Thank you. In terms of the high demand workforce sectors, are there any things that you want to share with this audience about where the highest demand is in our economy, um, whether that is by industry sector or even geography? Yeah, I, well, I certainly um, there's a, and you talked, you mentioned cyber um, a few times. Certainly that's probably where there, there's a biggest supply and demand imbalance right now. And the military is obviously just a wonderful uh, talent pool for those kind of jobs because you know some some people are, are are doing that as part of their as part of their you know MOS even those who aren't because they have uh, presumably a security clearance or, or would qualify for security clearance and again they have the intelligence and and wherewithal to become a, a military person in general that that is a wonderful place. Um, to vector people to, and uh, because of the supply and demand uh, imbalance there, the salaries tend to be very generous. So uh, a service person coming out at any rank uh, is going to um, have the potential within a matter of years to make you know multiples of, of what they were making in the military. Not that it's all about money, but that's just you know a nice thing to, for people to know. Um, military people, in terms of where they want to go. Um, it, it lines up fairly nicely with that. Uh, so IT sort of in general, not just necessarily cybersecurity, but but IT in general uh, is a popular destination. Uh, so too are uh, building trades and uh, manufacturing, which is also lines up with the needs of the country because people talk about, you know, factory closures and, and uh, you know, the you know, a dismal state of uh, U.S. manufacturing, but I, I don't think that's really the story. We're seeing not only more work coming back to the U.S., not only is the sector uh, rising, but the sector, the, the manufacturing sector has a crisis on their hands because the skilled trades people in those plants, the electricians, the pipe fitters, the machine repair guys, and, you know, list your trade, they're all getting their retirement age. So uh, the average age of a skilled trade person right now is in, in their 50s. So this represents great opportunity uh, for someone uh, who's coming out of the military. And, and as you said, you know, those, you know, you join the military because you want to serve. By, by going into one of these uh, professions where uh, we need a capability as a country, we need a manufacturing capability as a country, you are serving. You're serving by another means, but, it, but it's a way to, to promote our prosperity and our security. I think advanced manufacturing is something that's not necessarily well understood in this country. We still think about our parents' manufacturing experience and, and automotive assembly lines and things like that. But advanced manufacturing in this country has become really interesting and the supply chains that are necessary for that have become really interesting. And as I've been talking with companies in the defense sector, they're talking about onshoring supply chains and the need to build those abilities to supply parts, widgets, uh, advanced manufacturing technologies and other things into our defense sector suppliers and into advanced aircraft and hypersonics and all of those sorts of things. So there's a great opportunity here to work with material science and, and go into that or to have a robust understanding of what our military is gonna put out in the field and, and adjust to that manufacturing. Yeah, I think a lot of them are members of uh, trade associations like the National Defense Industry Association or the Aerospace Industries Association and others. Anything that you can say about the, the advanced um, defense sector, advanced manufacturing or, or trade associations that you work with? Yeah, I, I would just say, you know, I would just underscore what you said. It, this is not only is it an 
important work, but it's a, it's a place uh, where you can build a, a very um, satisfying, lucrative, and, and a career in which you're going to constantly learn and evolve because the technology doesn't slow down. It keeps evolving and the people, uh, and, and again, this is why military people do so well in these kinds of jobs because you're constantly having to uh, learn new things, reinvent yourself in new ways and, um, and you know, position yourself to, to be of value, if you will. I, I do agree that the, um, you know, that the tides coming in on onshoring and in the defense sector in particular, there's, there's, you know, just national security reasons why we would want to, you know, sh you know, tighten those supply lines up a little bit. Uh, but I would say in general, I think it will never, the ebb and flow of onshoring and offshoring will never entirely be resolved because there's, um, you know, whether the, the free traders are in power, or the protectionists are in power, that's going to come, that's going to move back and forth over time. And then those businesses, right, they're in the business of constantly about, because they live in this dynamic world, they're constantly going to have to evaluate what's the manufacturing footprint look like. And when I say that, I'm talking about the entire supply chain, end-to-end -end supply chain, looking at the tier ones, two, threes, fours, and so on, all the way down to distribution. And they need to optimize for lowest uh, landed costs because you know they have the fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders. And because they live in a dynamic world, factories are going to close and factories are going to open and work's going to move sometimes outside of the country, sometimes back into the country, sometimes somewhere else in the country. And all of that is causing disruption. So the best thing that the veteran can do or the person who's employed in the space can do is make sure that they're not only proficient in what their what their job is today, but anticipate what learning they need to acquire for tomorrow so that they're going to be able to to be viable and add value in sort of the next the next you know iteration of the of the footprint. Absolutely important to understand. So broadly, what we've talked about is this workforce demand, the transition from military service to civilian service, the preparation while you're in the military for the rest of your military career and, and those other um, things that come afterwards. What would you say are the most important lessons that you took from your service in the Marine Corps and then the transition into the civilian sector? Yeah, I think the most uh, important lesson that I took was um, I, I learned the value of soul searching, right? Um, I think too many veterans make the mistake, or soon to be veterans, right? Transitioning service members make the mistake of, of thinking, what can I do, right? And they kind of look, they take an inventory of their skills and they're like, well, I could do, you know, these four things or these eight things. And they limit themselves by doing that. I think the, the better question is, what do I want to do? You know, don't don't limit yourself to what you think you can do. Start with what you want to do, and then um, and then figure out, okay, well, what's the gap between where I am today and where I want to be tomorrow, and then go after you know cl closing that gap. The value of asking what you want to do is it forces you to understand yourself, right? It forces you to understand. What did I like about the military? What didn't I like about the military? What, where did I get my energy? When was I at my best? What, are, what, do, I, what do I value? And, as, and as, you, as you ask yourself those questions, all of a sudden, you know, possibilities of what a really great job uh, might look like start to come into view. I mean, for me personally, you mentioned I went to Harley Davidson. I, at the transition, I had this, this idea, having done that soul searching, that you know what would be really cool? would be to be a plant manager of a Harley Davidson motorcycle factory, right? It was making something that I had passionate about as a product, but it was people intensive, it was operational, it had the things about the Marine Corps that I really loved. And uh, then never mind, I didn't know anything about manufacturing, right? I didn't, I wasn't a, you know, Six Sigma blank belt, I wasn't even an engineer, I had studied English in college, right? So, uh, but I had a vision right, of where I wanted to go, and, and uh, albeit it was eight years later before I closed all the gaps to be qualified for a job like that, but I was getting paid along the way, and I was having fun along the way, and I think people that are having fun and they're, and they're marching towards something that they get excited about are just going to do better, right, because it's not work. 
it's 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 an adventure it's a journey uh and i think that's the biggest thing so don't my advice is don't start with what can i do first of all it doesn't matter because we're gonna have to reinvent ourselves all the time anyway well you know what you can do today might not even be relevant tomorrow so go in aim for something that you can get excited about uh and i think if we all did that we'd all have a better shot of you know uh reaching our full potential when I left the uh, military, I decided that I wanted to go to law school, and I didn't know what I was going to do after law school, but along the way, I fell in love with higher education and stayed in higher education for 20 years, and, and uh, I, I would agree with you 100%. Um, you can find your way along the way. Uh, it, that's right. And I think that's been an interesting component of your career as you look at what you're doing. I think that's one of the reasons that I value higher education so much. And whether that is higher education while you're in the military, getting a bachelor's degree while you're serving as an enlisted member or immediately thereafter or an advanced degree, if you've already got an undergraduate degree and thinking about what you're going to do with that degree and that network that you form being so important and, you know, finding people who are doing things that are interesting and, and so on. So I think it's a really critical component yeah. of that. And just to piggyback on that, James, the, yeah, the networking thing is really important because I I didn't uh, go back to the Harley Davidson thing. Once I decided I wanted to be at Harley Davidson, now I had to get hired by Harley Davidson. And the only, the, my toe in the door was I looked in an alumni database from my business school and I saw there was a guy who had, you know, gone to school there and I just cold called them and, you know, that opened a door for me that otherwise wouldn't have been available. So, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Yeah, one of my uh, wife's law school colleagues uh, actually is an attorney at uh, Harley Davidson. So I oh, think yeah. that networking piece is really important. And I think one of the things that's really important to think about here is how you use tools like LinkedIn and alumni databases to find people who are doing something that you want to do, is to go back to your point, and talk to them about how they got there. And so I would encourage people to think about doing that as well. Well, we're coming almost to the close of this, so I want to give you a couple of minutes just to close out any thoughts that you have, uh, anything else you want to say about the Department of Labor or DOL vets, and any advice that you want to give to our leaders. Great. Thanks, James. Well, I, I just want to uh, thank you and, and you know, just for having me on here and allowing me to, to share some of the, the good work that we're doing in the Department of Labor, but what, what you do for educating both the men and women in and out of uniform at NDU and what a valuable uh, contribution you all make to our national security. So thank you for that. Uh, if I can leave with you anything is please uh, please do what you can. This is a team sport, get, getting these veterans or these soon to be veterans launched. So please do what you can to support them on their journey. Uh, and we certainly are here as an agency to support all of you uh, on your journeys. So again, just thanks. And it was a real privilege to spend some time with you today. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Secretary Lowry. So with that, I'll say thank you. I'm going to wrap up and I'm going to talk just for a minute about our next webinar. We'll be bringing on Christian Bros, who is the author of The Kill Chain, Defending America in the Future of High-Tech Warfare. He also was a senior aide to Senator McCain on the Senate Armed Services Committee, and he's currently Chief Strategy Officer of Endural Industries. We hope that his uh, lecture will be interesting to you and that you can register for that. Thank you again for participating in this webinar with Secretary Lowry. You'll receive a follow-up within about an hour and information on where to take a look at this recording if there's anything that you want to refer back to or share with the people who you work with and who are leading and need to understand what the Department of Labor does. So with that, thank you very much. Have a wonderful rest of your afternoon, everyone. Right. Thanks, James. Thank you.